taught in both primary and secondary schools across the Wigan borough, um, and I'm an art and DT specialist. Um, but I'm currently um, teaching in year six. I have been for the past four years. This is my fifth year um, at Platbridge Community School, and I'm the Upper Key Stage Two leader there, an English subject lead. But I'm also in charge of the transition. Um, now, to put that into a bit of context, um, our school is a multi-academy trust, and we're the lead school within that multi-academy trust. So we have lots of school kind of, kind of underneath our umbrella, as we as we say. Um, and the secondary school that's a part of our multi-academy trust um, is Rosebridge Academy, who we work very close with, closely with. And that's kind of where my role evolved from, um, building the relationship between our two schools, which worked out quite nicely because I used to work at Rosebridge Academy <laughs> when I was training to be a teacher. So um, my role has evolved from there, and I work solely on building those transition links, building links across the school, both academically and pastorally. So if we go on to the next slide... I'll get started. Sorry, Joanna, I've got some computer malfunctions. It's all right, don't worry. <laughs> Just also to put it into a bit of context with our primary school, so Platbridge Community School currently feed um, to about five secondary schools. We don't really have one main main secondary school that we feed to, which logistically it can be a bit of a nightmare um, because our children, they don't. There's not most of them that goes to one of them. They tend to go off in small clusters and quite evenly. Um, so logistically, it's a bit of a nightmare, and it's also a bit of a nightmare passing on the transitional information to make sure that children are learning from day one, which leads me into the what's the problem slide. So first of all, time is most certainly an issue. Um, whether you have a dedicated member of staff who's responsible for transition or whether it's somebody with an additional responsibility, time is definitely an issue. And what I tend to find working with different secondary schools and, and primary schools on this matter is that transition gets pushed to the side. And actually, it's a really, really important factor that we need to be considering in our children's education. Um, I don't know whether you're all aware, I've quoted it at the bottom of a document that's called off, oh, I've quoted it wrong first of all, I've said Ofsted, it should say Ofsted, <laughs> um, Ofsted, and it's the Key Stage 3, the Wasted Years document, which was written, I think it was, a, I think it was two years ago now, and it's all talking about an outline. And in how key stage three, there's a huge, huge dip in data um, and a dip in results because information isn't passed on accurately, assessments are inaccurate, um, they have the big six-week holidays, there's lots of play into it. And it's all about how as schools we can overcome that barrier to our children's learning. So again, that's one of the other problems. Also, what I've found is filtering key information and data throughout secondary schools can be quite challenging because of the sheer size of them. We're quite lucky within the primary setting because communication is really strong and we're quite small and close knit and everyone knows each other. Whereas when you get to the secondary school, you know, sometimes they go up to 10 form entry. So it's making sure that all of that relevant and useful and um, really important information that we give secondaries during the transition period is actually passed on and being used um, properly within that setting. Communication between the schools, I would say over recent years, especially the past three years, I've noticed a huge improvement um, with transition between and the building relationships between the primary and secondary schools across the especially the Wigan Borough, and I think that's since really this document, the Ofsted document was created, um, it, it brought the issue of transition to head teachers' attention. So I think it's really important that we're building relationships between primaries and secondaries, all of your feeder schools, and making sure that we're communicating key bits of information correctly. And I think most importantly what I want to just outline is that if we get transition right, 
this the whole process should be completely seamless and children should have accelerated progress from day one in September. Now obviously you've got your week of playing around, getting to know the children, rules and routines, etc. But more certainly we want to be avoiding this year seven and eight day to day, which we're currently seeing. So if we move on to the next slide. Thank you. So the second thing that I want to talk about is that whatever our schools, whether it's from a primary setting or a secondary setting, whatever we put in place, we want to ensure that we're measuring the impact of it. And whatever we are doing is having a positive impact on the outcomes and provision for our children and to try and reduce this data dip, most importantly, and accelerate progress. Um, the main reason for this, why I, why I wanted to discuss it, is that quite often, because transition is an extra bit and a bit on the side, um, and it's someone's extra responsibility, that, that the time that we do invest in that area, we want to make sure that it's really, really purposeful. So it's how can we measure the impact of what we put in place. So I've put down a few, a few ideas for this. So you've got the data collection, so measuring progress and attainment. So looking at the teacher assessments at the end of year six, SAT scores with the standardised scores at the end of year six but also monitoring that when they get into year seven and eight so looking at autumn assessments and spring assessments and summer assessments and I think it's really key to kind of have the communication between the secondary and the primary setting about those assessments because more often than not I've had conversations with secondaries about children who have been in my class and have either in previous years seen levels that they're achieving and now I'm seeing standardised scores that they're achieving and I'm really, really shocked by it. Um, and sometimes that can be simply down to children testing out their new teachers and the new setting and they're kind of pushing the look a bit, if that makes sense. Um, so if there's any severe anomalies with our children. Sometimes all it takes is for a meeting between that child, somebody from the primary setting and the secondary setting, to all sit down together and say, I know you're better than this. Um, and I know you can achieve more than that, so come on, I'm going to be monitoring this and I'm going to be speaking to the secondary schools to make sure you're achieving your full potential. Um, into that, student surveys and questionnaires are a really good way of measuring the impact of the things that we put in place. It's important that any focus groups and questionnaires um, aren't just focused on pastoral side, so how do you feel in your new secondary? Have you made friends? Make sure that there's questions there that can kind of support the academic transition. And then finally, attendance to make sure that there isn't a dip in that area. Okay. So I've spoken a bit about this, I've mentioned it, about the difference between academic transition and pastoral transition and I think speaking from secondary experience and primary experience um, what I have noticed is that we tend to really fo focus heavily on the transition of pastoral information during, during these meetings towards the end of the year with secondary schools and we spoke of spoken about parental support, whether they're SEN, behaviour takes up lots of time, home life, and yes, all of that is really, really important because all of those outside of the classroom elements need to be right in order for our children to learn, but let's not forget about all of the wealth of academic information that we have at primary schools that we can pass up to secondaries to make sure that they've got a holistic view of this child. So we've got teacher assessments, SATS results, all the foundation tracking that we might do within a school. So we might have children who really excel within art and design and DT, but lack musically because they've not quite got the rhythm. Uh, looking at previous assessment data, is there any patterns? You know, primary schools, key stage leads, assistant heads, deputy heads spend weeks and weeks doing data analysis and well in year six where does that analysis go why aren't we sharing that information and that detailed um, context that, and detailed information that we've got about these cohorts and we're not passing it up anywhere um, curriculum coverage so is there an aspect that hasn't been covered in the curriculum as in depth as you perhaps like 
um, standardisation, moderation materials, any can-do assessment sheets, exemplar work, and intervention and boosters that we've got put in place for individual children. So it's really important that we focus during any meetings or discussions with secondary schools that we're passing on all of this wealth of information that we have. Okay? So, again, outlined in the Ofsted document, Key Stage 3, the waste years. Um, they outlined in that document, I think it's important to point out that when they come into both a primary setting and a secondary setting, they will be discussing transition. And if you look on the Ofsted framework, actually, transition is much more heavily weighted than it used to be on the Ofsted framework. So that's something to note. And if it is your area of responsibility, I'd definitely recommend pulling off those pages from the framework and becoming really familiar with them about their expectations of what they'd like to see. But again, the, the emphasis is too much on pastoral transition and it needs to be more so on the academic support. It's equally as important. It's of equal weighting. So just a little reflection point, perhaps something that you need to consider at the end of this webinar is what do you do as a school to support the academic transition up to secondary school or even within school between key stages. Okay. So sharing data, as I've mentioned before in the table, we have a wealth of data within primary schools and we very, very heavily monitor and track individual pupil progress. So my question I pose really is why don't we share all of that information? Um, because it, it's really, really rich. Um, currently high schools receive SATS results, but why do we not share everything else? We've got foundation tracking, our core subject tracking, previous assessments, teacher assessments, and even I've gone as far as and from feedback from the secondary schools that I've been working with, I've passed on completed SATS papers, and they have then used those SATS papers and done a gap analysis and incorporated um, those gaps into their teaching to try and plug the gaps to, to, to kind of aim for that accelerated progress as soon as within the, the, the autumn term of year seven. And they found it really useful, so it might be something that you'd be willing to consider. All it takes is an email really to the primary liaison or the transition coordinator within that setting. Okay. Finally, well not finally, moving on even, um, something that I did want to talk about was the transition documentation that we're using. Um, I was really frustrated this year because um, I think four out of five of the secondary schools who came down to have the transition meetings about our individual children, they weren't even aware that we weren't on levels anymore and that wasn't how we were reporting our, assessment, um, our assessments. So I just thought I'd put this slide in because this is a template that I made for Rosebridge Academy to collect their data on and it's just got the key terminology on that, that, the, that the government have stated that they're using so then it's kind of blanket for everyone and then it can be really easily interpreted within the primary setting. Um, I'd also just like to point out um, the parental support com uh, column. I had a focus group with a couple of different primary schools around the Wigan area, a couple of different high schools, and we all decided that actually within the primary school setting, we might have families who are very, very heavily supported, especially, you know, at our school, we've got a Start Well Centre, um, so we're right through from 0 to 11, so parents feel really, really supported, and it's important that if a family has had a lot of intervention and a lot of support, that that information is passed on to the secondary school to try and ensure that support programs and processes can be put in place for them straight away and conversations and meetings can, can happen straight away rather than it happening as a consequence of an issue arising. Okay? So curriculum continuity, which is really, really key for avoiding the Year 7 dip. So there's lots of ways that we can try and develop a continuous curriculum across Year 6 and Year 7. Um, first and foremost, which I found really useful, is cross-phase curriculum planning. So working with Key Stage 3 teachers and Key Stage 
to teachers, particularly year five and six, and doing curriculum mapping activities to make sure that we're not um, covering the same things, that things can be covered in more depth in Key Stage 3. We've also done a coverage document, whereas it was completed by someone within the Wigan Local Authority, and she went round to all of the primary schools and gathered the overviews of what we were covering in topic time, so if they were doing Romans, if they were doing um, waterways, if they were doing what makes Britain great, and they got the coverage and they've sent that up to high schools, then they can kind of incorporate some of those into their learning objectives for lessons. Something that's been really interesting that we worked with with uh, Rosebridge Academy is we set non-negotiables for children to be working on in, towards the summer term. So we asked secondaries, um, especially the core subjects, maths, English, science, what, what would be really, really useful for you if our children were really secure? And what's your bugbear when these kids come up to you in year seven? What winds you up? What, do they, what can they not do? And we try and make sure that we target those things within the summer two term after, after um, SATs. Consorti across phase moderation. So our secondary schools are invited to our moderation meetings so that especially the English staff um, are becoming increasingly familiar and confident with the key stage two curriculum, assessing it and knowing the expectation. And also that increased expectation at the end of Key Stage 2. Um, so so um, that's really important. And then using accurate prior learning and assessment um, to assess learning and next steps. Sorry, I've got people coming in the room and they're walking past and they can see that I'm, I'm talking to myself in the room, so apologies. Don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> I thought we'd lost you then. Oh, I thought you'd yeah. done a runner. They all, no, they all think I'm going mad, honestly. <laughs> no. Um, so, consortium across phase moderation has been really successful and it's been really useful for the Key Stage 3 staff. Um, to accelerate that progress. Okay, next slide. So, changes to the primary curriculum. There's been huge, huge changes, huge changes to the SATS test, to the assessment pro protocols, and it's making sure that whoever we're working with are really aware. What I found interesting was working with the English and the maths departments within the secondary setting is that they have no idea about these curriculum changes. So our children were going up to them in year seven, and they just thought they were working at the same standard. They had no idea that actually the goalposts have massively been shifted, and the expectation is so much higher um, that, that our children are getting to them, going up to them now at such a higher level, and they had no idea about that. So I think that's a really important thing to uh, to point and perhaps have conversations with your feeder secondary schools because our children you know they might not be working at the expected level anymore but the writing might be absolutely amazing and I think that's a point that I've put on there that no children aren't working within in writing if the writing isn't joined and if they can't spell accurately but actually the artistic flow and the creative flow and the grammatical accuracy of their writing can be outstanding and within a key stage three setting spelling and handwriting isn't marked on it doesn't matter as much um, it's all about that flow of writing so it's something that's really important to point to point out to them maths curriculum problem solving heavy and again reading requires a high level of fluency so we've got children who are no longer working with them because they simply didn't have the reading stamina Okay, so moderation and standardisation, I've touched on this previously, um, English staff found it really, really useful um, at Key Stage 3 to come and join the primary moderation meetings within their cluster because they got to see the experts, they got to gauge starting points for Year 7, they gained a huge um, knowledge of, a wealth of knowledge of the Key Stage 2 curriculum changes. 
and it's hugely, hugely, hugely impacted their practice within the Year 7 classroom. They're incorporating SPAG into their lessons now, whereas grammar really hasn't been heavily weighted on their curriculum. So it's been a really useful, um, useful tool that we've put in place, so I definitely recommend that. Okay. Um, and then coming towards the end of my slides now, I wanted to talk about transition units of work. So it's something within the summer two term after SAT that the children can complete um, as an ongoing project or process that they'll be familiar with that they can then take with them um, in September up to their secondary school. Something that's been really useful um, is the exercise books. The last after SAT, the last few pieces of writing in their English, they completed in an exercise book that they then took up to the secondary school. So that works really well. Things like fact files all about me, um, they've created within the primary setting, but then they've passed them on and they've looked at them and used them as a tool um, within form time. Reading books, um, gathering reading lists from the year seven, and teachers and incorporating them into the year six work um, to try and prep them for the curriculum and then just some other ideas of having a passport to year seven which is a bit like an all about me and then a five things I want to achieve which could be displayed on the hand. I've seen that working really nicely in schools in Manchester so they do the five things I want to achieve within secondary and then those are then displayed within the form rooms and it's just that Familiar, familiarity, I can't get the word, so when they get there and they can see something that they've made and it kind of just settles them. Okay? And then most importantly, um, you've got to make sure that whatever information that you give, whatever whatever you do, that it's having an impact and that it's being used. used. Um, and finally, I'm really aware that obviously we've got mainly people from a primary setting within this webinar. So everything that I've talk, talked about here, it can all be applied to any transitional phase. So from foundation stage up to key stage one, key stage one to lower key stage, lower key stage to upper key stage, and upper key stage to key stage three. The principles are the same. It's just applying them to the different age ranges and settings. Um, so hopefully you've been able to pull out some of the key points and applied it to whatever setting that you're working within and your area of responsibility. So again, the key principles, pick a few actions that will have the biggest impact, ensure that someone's accountable for this area, share pastoral and academic information, communication is key, and have high expectations and undertake accurate assessments to support that accelerated progress from day one, well, from key stage three or in your earlier transitional phases. So I hope that's been useful. I think that might be my last slide. It might not be. Um, let's have a look. Yeah, yes. that's the end. We'll go back to that okay, one. So thank you for listening. If you've got any questions, please please feel free to ask me. I hope you've been able to get something for, from this and my Wigan accent. Hasn't been too terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be daft. Um, I think I'm gonna. It looks like people have got microphones now, so I'm gonna try going around um, people and seeing if they can ask questions. So, Chris, can you talk to us? Hello, Chris. Can you hear me, Joe? Yeah, I can hear you. You can hear me good. <laughs> Chris in Bradford. Maybe Chris has gone for a brew. Maybe he's gone. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't have thought so. Anyway, Chris, if you can hear us, can you put any questions in the chat at the bottom? Um, I'm going to come around to Katie now and see if she's got any questions. Hello, Katie. Hello. Is anyone there? It, it looks like they're there, Joe. I'll just give it another hmm. one. Hello. Maybe they all just want to get the marking done. <laughs> no. Katie, can you hear us? Sounds like someone's there. I'm just going to mute you a second, Joe, and see if... Hello? Is Katie there or Chris? 
I can hear something. Um, oh, I've got a question from Chris. It's come, he's done it. Okay, so Chris has got a problem with sound. Um, do you have any questions, though, Chris? From that lovely wealth of information. Same for Katie. If you've got any questions, can you just type them in? <laughs> 